In fact, here's an interesting dilemma, right? Um, and, and compare it to um, a TV show, right? So what? Um, what was the one with Jerry and Elaine and, and George and Seinfeld. Seinfeld? That's it. So when Elaine pushes Jerry and goes, he just pushes him. In fact, I forget if he falls over or not. I think he does, right? And you're watching that on TV. There's actually no motion taking place. You're just seeing pixels changing colors, right? Um, that is actually the same thing that's really happening with us in everyday life. So basically, the quarks that make up the particles that make you up, right? Multiple levels, atoms, molecules, cells, etc. right? They're going in and out of existence constantly, right? And if you think about it, everything's moving. You know, so the Earth is traveling at, what, 2,500 miles per hour, right? As it's orbit, as it's rotating, right? Plus, it's moving around the sun, 365 days a year, however many miles per hour that is. Plus, the sun is traveling through space at 450,000, no, 450 feet per second, going towards Orion. I'm I'm screwing up all the, but you get the idea. We're moving in lots of different directions all the time. And the particles aren't moving with us. Particles stay where they are. So the particles that we're seeing that reflect, you know, Brendan sitting there, right? I said that right, right? Mm -hmm. um, Sharon sitting there, right? Those particles are actually constantly changing. So the particles that make you up are not the same particles that you are right now, right now, right now, right now. What's staying the same, theoretically, is the organization of the particles. So what I'm seeing right, in other words, it's just like a TV screen, right? Except that the particles are not really the same. When we're looking at the TV screen, you see, see the same little uh, lights, I guess, that are giving us the colors, red, green, blue, right? But what we're seeing is, is Jerry and Elaine are interacting with one another, you know. That's, in fact, it's, I just realized, you know, it's actually more complex than that because even though the TV screen theoretically has the same receptors, they're only the same because the particles that make them up are maintaining the same kind of organization. It's not that the particles are the same, because it's moving along with us, along with the Earth, <laughs> with the Sun, etc. Right? So it's much more complex than thinking we're seeing a physical object that's maintaining itself in time and space. Instead, what we're seeing is an organization that's actually changing somewhat. So in a sense, I'm not the same person I was when I first came in here this morning, or even right now, or right now. Oh, perfect. What would you mean by the same? The organization. Well, but the organization is changing because different things are happening affecting me through my experience. So I'm not actually the same person from one moment to another. Except, except as far as the government is concerned, because they're gonna tax me because of my social security number, which doesn't change, right? And even though my wife gets the money, they consider it mine because I'm the one that got paid it, even though she gets it, right? Um, so, I'm not really a self. Instead, I'm a strange loop. 
Um, this is Douglas Hofstadter, who's a cousin of a friend of mine. And his father was important too. Um, but in any case, I am a strange loop. This picture, by the way, he took with one of the early uh, video cameras that he, able, he was able to plug into itself so that he had, had a loop. So that what it was doing is seeing his hand, seeing his hand, seeing his hand, right? You can see was the cover, uh, which was, I thought was pretty neat. Um, but I am a strange loop, so um, there's no physical structure that remains me over time and space. Instead, there's instead just a complex system, an arrangement of energy that is me in my mind. And even though it's, it's, it's subtly changing from moment to moment, I have this self-consciousness that's part of that arrangement that keeps thinking that I myself is persistent over time, even though I'm not. Okay? So I'm kind of a strange loop, constant loop that keeps telling myself that I'm who I think I am, even though I'm changing constantly. Um, this all fits beautifully with Barclay's conception of the self and the mind of God. So that whole thing, all the energy, all in its arrangement in time and space, Barclay calls God and argues that Locke's conception of substance, material substance, makes no sense. And in the dialogue, which you get uh, between Helos and Philonus, oh, that's not the actual dialogue. That's what I had. Here you go. So this is this is written kind of like a platonic dialogue. We've got these two characters that are arguing about things, and they're, what they're arguing about is Locke's uh, conception of matter, and whether or not we can observe it or not. And it becomes obvious as they discuss it that you can't actually see it, hear it, taste it, touch it, etc. And the primary qualities that Locke argues must be there because they're actually in agreement with Locke on the secondary qualities, right? But the primary qualities, it turns out, you can never actually know them except through the secondary qualities. So therefore, you can't actually even know the primary qualities. Uh, and so therefore, Locke's system is self-contradictory. And that's stupid. We don't want to believe in a theory that's self-contradictory. Um, and so, uh, we have to get rid of that, and so everything has to be energy or spirit. Remember, he's an idealist, and at the time that was the word that they had, right? Um, and, and a lot of people, by the way, uh, you know, if you take the graduate record exam in philosophy, make sure you say yes, Barclay was an idealist, and yes, that's stupid, etc., because you want to pass the test, and the people that set up the test are wrong. So you, you agree with them because you want to get a good grade, right? Um, but at the same time, uh, I think I'm right that he and Leibniz are both thinking in terms, even though they call it spirit, the monads are like little souls, right? Well, what, are, what would you call them if you were thinking uh, of quarks you know, at that time? They didn't have the concept of energy that we have. Uh, so. Um, I mean, it's even, it's closer to what we're thinking today than what uh, Thomas Aquinas is obviously trying to say when he's talking about angels, right? But at the same time, uh, I, I think Barclay was much closer. And by the way, even the Wikipedia, which can't be wrong, says that that's the case. That he's, he's much closer now to what we think is the case than, um, and so... This is, a, a lot of this dialogue is just banter between these two to get you into the uh, 
you know, idea that, you know, they're two friends having a chat uh, instead of an argument over uh, a theoretical concept. But, you know, skepticism and uh, uh, his concern, of course, um, is uh, that if you try to use Locke's theory, you're not going to actually ever be able to find the thing in itself. It's impossible. And as a result, people were, are going to end up becoming skeptics and feel like we can't know anything. Which, that's not true, by the way. We do know things for sure within context, right? So, so and this is Einstein, by the way, right? Theory of relativity. And by the way, both Berkeley and Leibniz were believers in relativity as opposed to Sir Isaac Newton, who believed in a steady state universe. His, his uh, acceptance of Euclid's geometry, uh, that there's like a straight line that you could like map the universe on this map, right? So that, you know, here's the, here's the map of the universe and here's where everything is you know, on this map. Um, notice we don't think that way anymore. You might find maps and so on by various uh, opportunities. I, grammar school, with my kids, we came in and we had the sun and we had the planets, you know, hanging, you know, paper mache painting. Great project, really looked good. Um, and, you know, of course, Billy got a, a great grade for all the work I did, you know. <laughs> and then when Katie's turn, you know, we couldn't do the same project. So we did the moon instead, and she, she got a good grade for that. We made the moon, big, big moon, paper mache moon. Um, now all that stuff is supposed to be, you know, like, like you see, you know, the sun in the middle and all that stuff, right? You know, and actually, you know, that works, it's true. So if you're gonna say, what rock is the earth from the sun? Third rock, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. we've got Mercury, Mars, and the Earth. Venus. Oh no, Venus was going to be fourth, right? Venus is. Actually, no, Earth. Wait, Mars is. Mars, Mars is away from the Sun than Earth, so it's still going to be third. Oh, 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 you're right. Mercury, Mercury, Venus. Mercury, 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 because we had so many other planets that were becoming planets that they said, oh, we can't remember 15 planets, so let's, you know, let's take it down to eight. That's, so now we've just got eight. That's too much fun. Um, the Euclid is useful. You couldn't have built this building unless you were using Euclid's geometry. Because if you were using hyperbolic geometry to design this building, even though I think it's been here, what, 20, 20 years or so, the engineers would still be designing it if they were using that kind of geometry, uh, especially back then because they didn't have computers that could do it, <laughs> right? Um, so obviously you use Euclidean geometry because it works in practice when you're doing certain kind, kinds of tasks. But yes, if you're trying to get some, some object to land on Mars, you're going to have to use hyperbolic geometry today in order to figure out that. It's just absolutely amazing. How many of you watched the uh, uh, satellite, not sat, I don't know, what do you call it? A spaceship, I guess. It sounds funny. But we sent a spaceship out uh, to uh, kind of loop around the moon. Yeah, uh, I guess it was pro. Artemis? Isn't it Artemis? Um, you could watch, I watched it, like every day I would watch some of it, you know, because you got cameras feeding back, telling you uh, how it was going around uh, the moon and everything, and I, I'm pretty sure it was Artemis. Yeah, Artemis 2. Artemis 2. Not
tell you what capsule and where they landing? Yeah, this is the future. There, this is not uh, the one that they already did, but. Um, so I guess that's going to be like Artemis. I guess that's more of a capsule then, unless they land. So that's Artemis two. I don't want two then. I want Artemis one. Splash down. 